All right, thank you so much, Brittany, and uh, welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, could you guys just please let me know if uh, the audio and video is coming through okay for you? I've taken myself off mute, so I just wanna make sure you guys can hear me all right. All good, great, all right. So, welcome to a CCNA's primer for network automation. You guys asked for this, so I sent out a couple weeks ago via LinkedIn and Twitter a question saying, hey, everybody preparing for your CCNA, what would you like to see? And uh, by far, the topic that came back to me the most was this, network automation. Um, so, a couple of, a couple of just expect things here. So number one, if you think I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about network automation in about 45 minutes so you can pass that section of the CCNA, that's not going to happen. Okay, so um, there's a lot to know uh, and I can't cover it all in 45 minutes. So this is just to, to sort of whet your appetite and um, get your feet wet with it. Um, secondly, the good thing is, you know, when when I'm sure you're like me, you know, when, when I first saw the, the syllabus come out for the new CCNA and I saw the network automation was like a whole bullet point there in the blueprint, I thought, what the heck is this? This is something we've never seen before. Uh, and so now I have to go into programming. I have to learn how to script as well as do, you know, Cisco. It's, it's hard enough for me to learn the iOS commands and what command goes into what mode and what, and now I got to know all this other stuff too, just to pass my CCNA. No, you don't have to. So the great thing is, is that at the CCNA level, um, and even at the CCNP level, quite frankly, Cisco does not expect you to know how to actually implement or do anything with regards to network automation. Especially at the CCNA level, you don't have to learn scripting, you don't have to learn anything above Cisco IOS, quite frankly. For network automation, it's all about just memorizing terms, memorizing facts, and being able to tell you know, what's different between this automation tool and that automation tool. And just at a really, really high level. So don't be freaked out that this new thing is here. It's, it's not as mind blowing as it might seem. Uh, you know, when I took the new CCNA a couple months back, the network automation stuff I found to be actually pretty easy. So I, I think you will too. So without further ado, let's go ahead and, uh, and get into this. So uh, for those of you who haven't seen me before, my name is Keith Bogart. Here's my contact information at INE. Uh, should you have any further questions? Also, I will mention that um, much, not all, but much of the material I'm using for this webinar is taken directly from my Introduction to Network Programmability and Automation course that's part of our CCNA learning path. Uh, so if you are an INE customer and you have access to that learning path, that's like a that one course alone is like four hours of much more detail than what I can present right here. Okay, so when you think of the phrase network automation, what does that mean to you? So when I first heard that phrase, this is what came to my head. I thought, oh, wow, okay, so there's some, some GUI out there. I, I can load some, some apps, some software on my MacBook or my uh, Lenovo laptop or something, and with a simple push of a button, all my routers will be configured for OSPF. They'll be placed in the right areas. It'll sort of magically figure out what the subnetting should be for me. It'll know what my access list should be and you know what TCP and UDP port numbers to block and permit. And it'll bake a plate of brownies for me. They'll pop out of the oven downstairs. This is like awesome stuff. Okay, well, network automation might get to that point at some point in time, but is not there right now. Network automation is not like that. So if somebody tries to make you think, oh, network automation means that we don't need network engineers anymore. The software will just do it all. That is not the case. And we are far from that. So the main purpose of network automation, as I'm sure that you've read, if you've looked at this at all, is simply to minimize repetitive tasks. What does that mean? Okay, so think about this for a moment. So imagine that you are a network administrator and you're in charge, of, we'll just keep it Cisco for now, okay? You're in charge of your network of Cisco routers and switches, okay? So if I were to ask you, and you don't have to answer this, but just think about this. If I was to ask you, what types of repetitive tasks do you find yourself doing over and over again on a daily or weekly basis with your network? Well, 
might actually be a little bit hard to answer that question. And a lot of that depends on the size of the network. So as it says here, the need for automation varies across networks. So if you've got a fat, rather small network, you know, if you're a, a small to medium business where you've got, oh, maybe oh, one to four uh, routers, maybe five or six switches, chances are probably pretty good that when you got them out of the box, you, you still needed to console into those guys to do some initial configuration. Um, by the way, with network automation, a, a piece of this, there's something called plug and play. And the idea of plug and play is that you're supposed to be able to take a, a, a router or a switch or something out of the box, plug it into an existing functioning network, and that plug and play protocol will do everything. It will most likely it'll start out with DHCP. So normally when we think of a laptop per PC doing DHCP, now we're talking about a router switch doing it. The router switch will get an IP address via DHCP. And then in that DHCP file that comes back, the router switch might be informed of, hey, here's another IP address you need to go to to get everything else you need. And then it'll reach out to like a software controller like DNA Center or something and get all the other configuration. But not every networking device is capable of that. Uh, that's right now the minority. There very few networking devices can actually do that. So chances are pretty good, going back to my previous scenario, that you can't rely on plug and play. So when you unbox your routers and switches, you're still gonna have to get down and dirty with the command line and configure all that stuff I talked about. You'll have to configure your access list, your EIGRP and OSPF, your IPv4 addresses, all that stuff. You'll still have to do with the command line. So right there, network engineer is not going away, right? Now, let's say you're done with that, okay? So it took you maybe a week at the most to do that with your small network. Okay, most small companies, that's about it, right? I mean, at that point, once the network is up and functioning, most small companies, how often do they have to go back to it and change it in any way? Probably hardly ever. Uh, if it's routing to the internet, if it's providing connectivity between the cubes and the offices, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So most companies like this, there really wouldn't be any need for automation. But now if we go to the opposite end of the spectrum and we talk about huge government enterprise networks, well, there, there might be a greater need for automation because the, the larger the company, the greater the probability that things are, are changing on a more frequent basis. For example, if you have a company that uh, develops applications, maybe that's what your company does. You write software programs and as part of those software, as part of that development cycle, you actually introduce those programs into your network and to see how it affects your network. And, and you may be part of what your job is, is you know, every month or so as you're rolling out a new software application on your own network for testing, you want the network to adapt to that. You say, okay, network, once you start seeing this kind of new traffic that I'm putting into you, here's what I want you to do. All you routers, all you switches, I want you to apply this new QS policy. I want you to apply this new access list to, to keep this new software I'm introducing sort of contained and make sure it doesn't spill over into my production network, right? So if that type of thing is happening on a fairly regular basis, well now network automation might be useful to you. Now instead of logging into each of those routers and switches one at a time and introducing the, the new QS or access list policy, we can all, do it all in one bulk job with network automation. And I'm sure if you guys think about it, there might be other things that are done, once again, on probably larger networks that are done as sort of like a repetitive task, right? You know, chances are you're probably not introducing new VLANs all that often. Now, I, I don't see many companies saying, oh, every week we introduce a new VLAN. That probably doesn't happen. Um, changes to access lists, that probably doesn't happen a whole lot. Um, but if you, if you have a company where you have a lot of people coming and going, like a lot of new hires coming in, a lot of people leaving, uh, rotating in, in, in people's tasks and jobs, that could result in the changes to the network happening fairly frequently, like access lists being updated, uh, usernames and passwords being changed, things of that nature. So you really have to think to yourself, anytime I can think of a situation where normally I would have to log into a bunch of devices, 
and issue a bunch of repetitive command lines. Hey, maybe I even got like a text file that's got like the same five or six iOS command lines and I just copy and paste that among like 15 different devices. That is a prime use case where network automation will save you time and effort. Okay, so what can be automated? Well, all kinds of things can be automated. It's really just a question of, is it worth your time and investment to learn how to do it? Because there's a pretty steep learning curve involved with actually implementing this stuff. Buying the necessary software, you know, if you're not getting open source stuff, if you're getting stuff like Cisco DNA Center, which is, you know, a minimum of $80,000 a pop, you got to do that. So all kinds of things can be automated. It's just, is it worth it? So we talked about this plug and play initial provisioning. I talked a little bit about that. That basically means that I'm taking a networking device and I'm implementing it into my network and it's a clean slate and I use plug and play to bring up all the initial settings. By the way, I don't know what's my printer just started magically making sounds now. So hopefully you guys don't hear that in the background. It's just going crazy. Um, pass segregation via dynamic overlay networks. What the heck is that? So an overlay network, all right, can we turn you off, please? Okay. So just as a review, an overlay network basically means um, I have an underlay network. An underlay network is just a regular old network that you and I know it's already configured, it's already got routing, you can, you can already get from point A to point B. That is our underlay network, right? An overlay network would be like a system of tunnels on top of that. Like as part of the CCNA, you have to learn about things like GRE tunnels and you know what an IPsec tunnel is, not necessarily how to configure it, but you have to know what it is. So whenever you have tunnels going across your underlay network, those tunnels are what is your overlay network. So the building of those tunnels, you know, when do we need a tunnel? Where's the tunnel start and where's it end? All that stuff can be automated via these things. Um, you can automate QS policies, security policies with access lists, uh, scheduled software delivery deployments, uh, topology, all sorts of things, right? Okay, so ultimately, the goals of network automation is to ideally make your life easier. Now, it probably won't make your life easier at the very beginning when you're implementing it. Because like I said, there is no network automation tool out there right now that you can just download an app, press a button, and it does its thing. That doesn't exist. All of these network automation software and tools and stuff, they all require some sort of scripting. They all have their own sort of unique command line or like in the case of DNA Center, DNA Center is mostly GUI based, but it is a massive GUI. There's so many options and drop down things. So there's still gonna be a steep learning curve at the beginning to implement your automation thing. But then hopefully, after you've spent that time on the front end, then you can just go back later on and literally type in one command or literally press a button and all that work you did at the front end will automate a whole bunch of stuff on the back end. So it's supposed to eliminate repetitive tasks. And by the way, I did see a hand get raised there, but I'm gonna go ahead and hold off on the questions till the very end, just to make sure we can get through everything here. Cause I do actually have a, a demonstration I wanna give you uh, using Ansible. Uh, and I wanna make sure we get to that at the end. So I think you guys can to read all this. I don't have to read all this to you. So the main goal is here also is to apply consistent policy across the network. This is another thing the CCNA will emphasize as far as, you know, if you get a question on what's the goal or purpose of network automation. Well, it's is to reduce repetitive tasks, but it's also to try to eliminate human error, right? If, if, I've, if I've got a, a, a team of network administrators, six or seven people doing network administration, I say, hey, John, you're in charge of routers one through five. Sally, you're in charge of routers 10 through 11. Now, John and Sally, Go to your group of routers and I want you both to implement this, you know, 100 line access list and this OSPF configuration as well as a slew of other things. Well, there's a pretty good possibility that one of them might fat finger their command and mess up something, right? When they're typing in, they might forget a line of an access list. They might type in the wrong port number. Well, if we use network automation, then we don't have to worry about that, right? It's just one set of instructions that's being mass produced across multiple different devices. And reduce time spent troubleshooting. 
Here's another, uh, you know, a lot of times people don't think about this as part of automation, but it can be. You know, imagine if somebody says, hey, um, I can't get to the internet. In my company, I can't get to the internet. Well, that could be a whole huge, huge slew of things. You might say, okay, well, what I need to do to troubleshoot that is A, I need to start by pinging every router and switch between that user and my internet gateway. Make sure they're all reachable. Well, that might be a couple dozen devices if you're lucky, right? That's one ping after another you have to do manually. Secondly, I have to log into each device and maybe issue the show interface command and look at the status of my interface, look for drops and stuff. It wouldn't be kind of nice if you could just implement a script or press a button that would ping all those devices and give you results back. It would automatically log into all those devices and collect the output of show interface and display that to you. That's how automation can help reduce time troubleshooting. Okay, automation origination points. This is basically talking about this, this thing that can send out these commands instead of you doing it, it can do it. Where does that reside? Where does it start from? Where's the origination of, op, of automation happen? Well, certainly you can have SDN controllers, right? There's, there's Cisco's APIC appliance. There's uh, Cisco's DNA center appliance, right? So these are actually things that you buy, you unbox, you rack mount them. They have software built into them and they are purpose built to automate things. So you could have it originate from there. Um, you could have your, your Linux server or your, your uh, Ubuntu box running a, a, a network configuration tool like Ansible or Chef or Puppet. We'll talk a little bit about those. And you could originate your scripts or your automation from there. And some devices, uh, for example, some Cisco devices actually have the ability to run scripts and stuff from within the box. Now you might say, well, why would I want to have my router have a scripting tool built into the router? Why would I want to do it there? Well, think about this. Maybe you have some need where you say, okay, um, if X, Y, and Z happens on this router, if, um, if this route disappears, if this interface flaps more than five times in a second, and if my CPU goes up to more than 90%, okay, let's just say if, if those three conditions happen, then I would like a script to run to automatically do a bunch of things. Maybe the script will bounce the interface. Maybe the script will implement a static route. Maybe the script will automatically run a, a, a command to look at the processes on the CPU find the offending process and kill it, right? So we could, have a, we could have a router that's got a built-in script that looks for those triggers. And then when those triggers happen, the router by itself implements its own Python script or something and automates itself to try to fix that problem. So we could use Python, there's, uh, there's tickle scripts. Uh, so that could happen as well. Okay, so here's the next question. So imagine for a moment, you say, okay, um, the type of automation I want to do is not with the built-in scripts on boxes, because actually there's very few boxes that have that, right? Of, of all the Cisco routers and switches they sell, a very small percentage actually have built-in Python scripts and stuff that you can access. So you say, here's what I want to do. I want to use some, some central device, maybe my MacBook, right? Or maybe the server sitting next to me. But I want that device to be the one that reaches out to all of my routers and switches and does my automation for me. I want it to send configuration files. I want it to check for the presence of access lists. And if an access list does not exist on a given router or switch, put it on there. Okay, so now what we're talking about is a device that's remote from the perspective of your router or switch accessing that router or switch. So now that raises the question, with all these devices that we need to program with a bulk job, how do we reach those devices? Well, you probably guessed it. We're gonna to have to use IP, the internet protocol, to get to those devices. Cause after all, we're gonna to have to package our configuration commands, our troubleshooting commands inside of IP packets and send those packets to all of our routers and switches. Now the question is, okay, how are we gonna do that? Well, there's two choices. We can use IP based APIs or we can use IP based CLI access. So let's just real quickly here do a quick primer on what an API is. 
So first of all, I always like to know what an acronym actually stands for. API is Application Programming Interface. And even if you've never heard of the term API before, you work with APIs all the time and you don't even know it. For example, here's something that probably every single one of you guys have done multiple times a day, where you, um, you're looking at a website and you decide you're going to highlight some of the text on that website. You're gonna right click and select copy and then you're maybe gonna copy that into something else, like a, a Word doc or a text file or something. Okay, you might not know it, but you're actually using an API to do that because the web browser, the code running in that web browser doesn't natively know about Microsoft Word. It doesn't natively know about Notepad as your text editor, right? Those, those are two applications that were not written to be aware of each other. So what an API is that an application programming interface says, we're gonna have something running on the box, which allows these two applications to interface with each other. So I can take the text from one and copy and paste it into another application. So it's an interface, it's like a doorway for programming of my application. In this case, the programming is I'm copying text from one application to another. Now, so there's all sorts of APIs are running locally on your laptop. Even if your laptop has no internet connection whatsoever, just for applications to talk to each other locally on your laptop, there's APIs to do that. That's not the type of API we're talking about. So what we're talking about here is an API running on a Cisco router or a switch that opens a doorway, okay? It opens an alternative method for you to push information to that device or retrieve information from that device. So let's think about this way. Now, up until now, chances are when you think about sending IP packets, let's say to a router, to, to give it information like here's a configuration line, here's a configuration file, or maybe to retrieve information, show IP interface brief, show version, okay? What's really going on there? Well, when you send that IP packet to that, that router, What's the application you're using? Well, it's probably gonna be one of two things. It's either Telnet or SSH, right? So the, you have to configure the router to be aware of Telnet and SSH so that if a Telnet or SSH packet comes in, it's listening to that protocol and it can say, oh yes, I speak that language. Let me unpack the, the, the bulk, the, the data of this Telnet or SSH packet, which by the way was riding on top of IP and inside there, oh, here's a configuration command for me, an iOS command, show IP interface brief, right? You had, to, you had to know the configuration command in order to pack it inside of the Telnet or SSH packet, okay? Well, that's great if you are a Cisco CCNA person, you've been learning Cisco iOS, right? But what if I'm a network admin and I, have got a network of Juniper devices, Cisco devices, uh, Vios devices, all sorts of different stuff. And I say, I don't really have time to become an expert on the command line of these five or six different vendor manufacturing devices we've got in our network. I don't have time for that. Here's where an API can be useful, okay? If I have, if the network automation tool I'm running, um, how do I, let me take a step back. If, if, Cisco, if Cisco says, hey, these routers that we've given you, they support an API. Here's the documentation for the API. And I say, okay, well, what do I wanna do? I want to program OSPF, okay? So I go into the API documentation and the API documentation says, okay, if you want to program OSPF, you don't have to know the iOS commands. You don't have to know about that, don't worry about that. Here's what you do have to know. When you send information, First of all, you gotta send it in an IP packet because the API is expecting IP and the API is probably not gonna expect it to come in the form of Telnet or SSH. Maybe it's expecting it to come in the form of HTTP, okay? So I'm gonna send an IP packet behind that. There's gonna be an HTTP header. And so my router's gonna say, oh, I'm listening for that because I've got an API that is an HTTP based API. I can listen to that. So then, when I send that packet, maybe in the body of the packet, instead of saying config T, 
router OSPF, network, blah, 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 which I would need to know if I was doing the command line, but in the API, maybe the API says, hey, all you need to do is, is type in um, OSPF in quotes, maybe a colon, and then network 5050. OSPF in quotes, colon, mask, 255-255-00. Okay, so I, I still have to provide the, the basic elements of what I want, you know, that I want to do OSPF, that I want to do a network, but I don't have to know the iOS command. The API is structured in such a way as I'm reading the API documentation. It says, look, if you want to send this information, here's how it has to be structured. And so now in my network automation tool, that's what I send. I, I say, okay, use this HTTP based API. I want to program OSPF. And now I don't have to actually know what enable mode is, what config T is, what's the router sub mode. What, I don't have to know all the commands. The API sort of standardizes it. And ideally, the API that Cisco implements would be the same as the API that Juniper implements. But even if it's not the same, the idea is that I don't have to know the command lines between Cisco and Juniper. If I read their API documentation, they will say, structure your data this way. You know, this, a colon, uh, quotation marks. And, and if you send it this way, the router switch will know what you're trying to do and it will do what you want. So now, just like we have on that router, an open door for SSH or Telnet. So if IP packets come in, it can see, it will expect iOS commands inside those IP packets. Now, if I've got an API on that device, it's another open door for IP, it's still listening to IP, but now it's expecting the body of that IP to be something different, like HTTP followed by something different. And I mentioned that all um, it, an API allows programs to send or retrieve data using structured data encoding such as JSON and XML. Not gonna go into JSON and XML here, that is something uh, that the CCNA will just want you to know, you know what's sort of at a real high level, the difference between them you know, they might show you some output saying, okay, is this JSON output? Is this XML output? You know, or which one of these is JSON or XML? They don't expect you to know the rules necessarily of all the nitty gritty details of how to create your own JSON or create your own XML. You don't have to worry about that. Just know at a real high level how they're different from each other. So that third bullet point really answers the question of, okay, if the API is not actually expecting me to send an iOS command like router OSPF1, network 5050000 area five. If it's not expecting that, what is it expecting? Well, it's expecting the information to come in a different format. And that format will probably be either JSON format or XML format. So remember, I said, this isn't just simply a click of a button, right? I said, there's still a pretty steep learning curve to actually implement all this stuff. So, you know, yes, you would have to, if you're actually gonna implement this, you would have to learn what JSON and XML are so you could create this structured data in a way the API would actually understand it when you send it over there. Okay, what I'm gonna focus on though for the rest of our time together are network configuration tools. So tools that can send iOS commands in bulk to a whole bunch of devices basically at the same time. So there's, there's several here. So for the CCNA, if you see these terms, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, another one is Salt Stack. If you see those, those are by and large command line tools, okay? One thing that's nice is that most, if not all of these are open source. So if I want to use Ansible, if I want to use Chef or Puppet, I don't have to spend any money. I can actually download their software and install it right in my MacBook, right in my Ubuntu uh, device, and I don't have to pay anything. Now, a lot of these, these, uh, these companies that made Ansible, Chef, Puppet, they do offer a, an enterprise version or a paid version of their tool. And you might think, well, why would I want to pay for it if I can get it for free? Well, here's the difference. Um, let's take Ansible as an example. So for the last couple of weeks, I've been playing around with Ansible. I never touched Ansible before, but I thought, you know, it'd be kind of cool to do a demonstration on at least one of these things. So I've been playing around with it. 
And of course, I was using the free version. And the free version of all of these things is always command line based. So you have to know a little bit of Linux. Yeah, and and they have to, the commands can be kind of terse and kind of weird to understand. It's not like iOS at all. It's totally different commands, uh, but it's all command line based. Whereas if I had bought the paid version of a lot of these things, a lot of times when you get the enterprise paid version, you get a GUI. You get a software package you can install, and now it's got a nice GUI. And so instead of knowing the command line, it's got drop-down windows and radio buttons and stuff. And when you select those things, it automatically programs the GUI or automatically programs the command line for you in the background. Okay, but that's one of the main takeaways is that all these things are open source. Most of them also have a paid version. If you get the open source version, well, you're gonna have to spend some time learning their command line. Uh, if you get the paid version, well, then you're gonna get a nice GUI to go along with it. What else is good about this? Okay. So these tools are good for accessing devices that do not offer APIs. Once again, a lot of Cisco devices right now don't offer APIs. So a lot of, um, so you know, if you buy like a, a Cisco Nexus switch, for example, that probably does offer an API. You know, the, the material will say, okay, in addition to accessing, accessing this device remotely via SSH or Telnet, we offer an API. So, if you send your data using JSON structure or XML structure, which means you got to put some quotes here, you got to put some semicolons here, uh, but you don't need to know the command line anymore. Now you just need to know that OSPF goes here, it's got a semicolon, your wildcard mask goes here. But if you send it that way, you can also program the device, an alternative to Telnet or SSH. But a lot of Cisco routers and switches don't have that. Right? A lot of routers and switches still fall back on either Telnet or SSH is pretty much the only way you can access them remotely via IP. So what we're talking about now is I still need some, some central device, a server like my Ubuntu box or something that has a list of IP addresses and each IP address corresponds to a router or a switch out there. So I have to know in advance what the IP addresses are of, of all the devices I want to automate and then what I can do is in this tool, like in my Ansible command line or my Chef command line, I can start writing commands that say, okay, go out and touch these 10 different devices. Here's the SSH username and password for all 10 of them. Once you connect, I want you to send this OSPF command, this network command, and this area command. And so now by just typing out this one line of this script, I can hit return on my keyboard and it does just that. Instead of me opening up secure CRT or hyper terminal or something one at a time for each of those 10 or 15 devices with that one command, it can SSH into all of them and implement that command all by itself. Well, not all by itself, but with just one command. So like I said, it's good for accessing network devices that do not offer API access if you want to automate something. Scripting for network automation. Okay, so a lot of scripting languages. What's, what's the point of all this? Those tools I just showed you, Chef, Ansible, Puppet. Like I mentioned, if you don't get the GUI version, well, even if you do get the GUI version, every single one of them requires some sort of scripting, okay? None of them are 100% GUI right out of the box. None of them are like that. Um, all of them require some sort of scripting. And like this says, there's lots of available scripting languages. Some of those tools are based on Python. So if you've already learned Python, you would probably want to pick the tool that uses Python as its basis for scripting. Um, other tools use other stuff like Ruby or, uh, or other scripting languages. We've already talked about how some Cisco routers and switches have built-in scripts that you can use like Tickle and Python. We've talked about that. Uh, I know I went through that pretty quickly, but I think we've already talked about everything on this slide. Okay, so let's focus a little bit more deeply on these tools right here. Okay. So before I go into a little bit more details about this, high level. So network automation can sort of fall into 
four general categories, I tend to think of it. Category number one would be plug and play. In other words, a tool where I want to be able to implement a router switch that has the plug and play functionality. Once that router switch obtains its IP address via DHCP, it goes to my tool and my tool provides all the initial configuration after that. All the access lists, routing, everything else. These things here are not for that. Okay, these things are not designed to do plug and play. I'm, I'm sure that if you're really advanced with some of the stuff, you might be able to get it to do that, but that's not really what they were designed for. So that's, that's one thing of automation, but that's not what these tools do. Second thing that automation could be used for, we've talked about this, is dynamically changing your network if certain triggers happen. For example, this is what Cisco DNA Center is really good for. So DNA Center says, hey, when a user connects to the network, all right, so when somebody's laptop plugs into a Wi-Fi access point, you know, wirelessly, or plugs into a switch, one of the first things they're going to do is they're going to authenticate against the network. They're going to have to provide some sort of credentials, maybe in the form of a username and password. Uh, maybe there's some sort of certificate built into their box. Who knows what it is, but they're going to authenticate. In the process of authentication, DNA Center is going to find out who they are, and more importantly, what their role is. Is this a payroll person? Is this a marketing person? Is this a human resources person? And then based on their role, Cisco DNA Center can then dynamically program the network. It can say, okay, this user is just plugged in. Because they're in this role, that role belongs to VLAN 50. That role should have these access lists applied across all the routers and switches. That role should have this QoS applied. So that's another form of network auto automation is dynamically changing the network when certain ha triggers happen, like a new user plugging in. Now we need to apply all this stuff. This stuff here, Ansible salt stack, that's not what it's meant for. Okay, DNA Center does that, but not this stuff. Then, then the, another form of network automation is troubleshooting, okay? Troubleshooting where somebody says, hey, the, the network is really slow. John over there in payroll says, hey, us here in payroll, we're having really slow internet connectivity today, okay? So if you want to automate the troubleshooting process, I've talked about that. That might involve, okay, let's, let's go ahead and send commands to every single box between John's default gateway all the way out to the internet gateway on the WAN, make sure the boxes can respond to pings, send every single box a, a show interface command and look for errors, okay? These tools here, they can do that. They can do it. So Ansible, salt stack. So now we're just talking about sending, you know, a series of iOS commands across a bulk range of devices all at once and then collecting the information back. These tools can do that. Now, DNA Center can also do that. What's sort of elegant about DNA Center is that these tools here, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, yeah, you can configure them to reach out to like 50 different IP addresses, all sorts of routers and switches, send SSH commands of show interface, uh, show IP protocols, and then, but, but what you're gonna get back is a whole slew of text. It's just gonna give you massive text back. And then you're still gonna have to spend time parsing through that text and saying, oh, right there, all right, there on router one, that interface is having problems. Whereas something like DNA Center, it can do the same thing in the background, but once it collects all the information, because it's GUI based, it can show you all these graphs and charts and say, oh, let's put a red circle on router number one because we found a problem right here. And here's the problem we found on router number one, that the GUI will actually display all that and make parsing through all that data you got back a lot more intuitive and better. So these things here, they can do that, but they're not really optimized for troubleshooting. These tools are really, really good for the fourth method of automation, which is simply pushing down in mass bulk configuration commands. If what you want to do is push down to 50 different routers, um, a whole new access list, these are great for that. If, you, uh, if right now you're using a certain NTP server, you know, maybe a time and date an NTP server is 5.5.5.5, and for some reason you say, okay, we're going to change that now. We're now gonna move over to 7.7.7.7. That's our new NTP server. And so we need to update all of our routers and switches with that new command. These tools 
are great for that. So what these tools are really optimized for is for reaching into routers and switches via typically SSH and, and looking for, does a command already exist on these boxes? Do these boxes already have an NTP server command? Do they already have um, a, um, an access list called test? Do they already have that? And then if they get the response back of no, that is not present in box one and box 15, then they can automatically push that configuration to box one and box 15. That's really what they're optimized for. Okay, so like I said, all these tools require some sort of CLI or scripting knowledge. Um, some, of the CL, some of the scripting sort of resembles Cisco IOS. Some is like totally and utterly different from it. Some tools use a GUI. Most tools don't. Uh, most tools, you have to learn their command line. Okay. Okay, so here's another uh, really important CCNA concept. So of those tools we're gonna look at, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, one of the high level things that makes them different is this right here. Uh, some of those tools require two software components. A component that you've installed and downloaded on your server, like your Ubuntu box or your MacBook or your big Linux server or whatever. And then a secondary software component that's actually living inside of the router or the switch. Here's an analogy. If you guys have studied SNMP at all, and at the CCNA level, once again, you I don't think you have to know how to configure SNMP, but they expect you to know sort of like what the components of SNMP are. So SNMP, the simple network management protocol, relies on two components. Inside the router switch, you have to activate an SNMP agent. Okay, it's usually done, but just like a couple of commands. And the SNMP agent is, is a software process, just like you've got OSPF as a software process and EIGRP as a software process. Well, now you've got an SNMP software process that you've activated with a command. And what's that thing doing? Well, it's collecting statistics. It's collecting statistics about packet counts on interfaces, about how many times an interface is flat, right? So the agent is the software in the router switch that's doing that. And then you've got the SNMP manager. That's the device that's sitting on your server that's got the nice GUI display. And so the SNMP manager will pull the SNMP, um, I just totally forgot what that term was, the SNMP agent and say, hey, give me the most recent statistics. Okay, so SNMP won't work if the agent portion is not running on your router switch. It just, it, there's nothing to respond. Same thing here with some of these configuration tools that we've been talking about. Some of them have a component that lives in the router switch and then talks to the other component that's sitting on your server. And so we call these masters and agents. So this is part of your decision process. If you're thinking, okay, well, I wanna start playing around with one of these configuration tools. Well, first thing you have to ask yourself is, okay, if I'm looking at two different tools and one says, this is a master and agent tool. This other tool is not. Okay, well, if this one says master and agent, then I have to ask myself, okay, the agent component is a component that's gonna have to be installed in my router or switch. Does my router or switch even support that? The answer is probably gonna be no. Vast majority of routers and switches do not support the agent capability of these tools. Some of them do, some of the high end like Nexus ones and stuff like that do, but most of them don't. So chances are, if you're looking at an automation configuration tool like Ansible, Salt, Puppet, whatever, you're probably gonna wanna pick one that does not have a master and agent, that basically is self-contained on the server itself and doesn't require anything special to be configured or done on the router or the switch that you're talking to. Now at the CCNA level, they're gonna want you to know that of these configuration tools that do rely on masters and agents, there's some difference in terminology. And that's really what a lot of the network automation comes down to in the CCNA is knowing what the terminology is. So for Puppet, if you're gonna use the Puppet configuration tool, it's like it says, master agent. Chef, hey, guess what? Master agent. The one that's different is SaltStack. SaltStack uses a master 
and minions. So that's just a memorization term. Just know that master and minions is with salt stack. Puppet and chef are master and agent. Notice what's missing here, Ansible, because Ansible does not use masters and agents. Ansible requires nothing special to be configured or done on the router or the switch. All the router switch has to support is SSH. If you configure the basic things to allow yourself to SSH into the router switch, now you can use Ansible to automate the configuration of that router switch. So that's why it's not on this list because it doesn't support masters and agents. That's why a lot of people prefer to use Ansible because it can be used across a wider range of networking devices. Okay, here's another thing. So of these uh, networking automation tools, some of them use a push model, some of them use a pull model. So a push model, this is like Ansible, right? A push model means you're on your server and you type in a, a, a script or, or a line of a script, you hit the return key and that pushes something to your router switch. Hey, configure this access list. Hey, tell me if you have uh, an NTP server with 5555. Oh, no, you don't? Well, here you go. Here's your configuration command. So it's pushing it. A lot of these tools that use masters and agents use a pull model where you will go onto your master and you'll say, this is the, the standard configuration for all my routers, okay? So all my routers should have a, a, um, an NTP server pointing to 5.5.5.5. They should all have this access list with these lines in it, right? This is the, the core stuff that's the same on all my routers. So you configure that on the master and then the agent periodically will reach out to the master. So the agents what's, what's sitting on your router switch and say, hey, you got anything new for me? What am I supposed to look like? And if it sees a discrepancy, it will pull from the master whatever those changes are. So some people say the pull model is not very good because if you make a change in the master, if you say, this is what all my routers should look like, well, the routers are not gonna look like that until the timer clicks off and they decide, hey, let me go pull down whatever's changed, which might be five minutes from now, 10 minutes from now. So if you prefer some sort of network automation tool that says, hey, once I configure this, once this is my, my script, that all the routers should implement. I want all the routers to have that now. I want it now. That's where you'd want to use the push model for that. All right, so creating configuration files. Um, so when you use these automation tools, there's basically three steps. Now we're, I'm talking about the command line here. So there's three steps involved at a real high level. Step number one is you have to tell these tools what the IP addresses are or the, DMA, the DNS domain names are of your devices, right? To say, okay, um, here's the list of 50 devices I want you to talk to, either via IP address or DMS, DNS name, in which case you would have to resolve it to an IP address. That's sort of step number one. A lot of times that's called an inventory file. So you create your inventory file. Then step number two is um, how we access that inventory if it's Cisco is gonna be a little bit different than how we access it if it's Juniper or if it's HP or Arista, right? So the next step would be to say, okay, of these 50 devices, this subset here of 11 devices, these are Cisco devices. So when you talk to them, use the, the Cisco model, all right? So it'll know, okay, I need to use iOS commands for that. Okay, so if you, if you wanna do OSPF, I, I have to know the iOS OSPF command, uh, I need to, Expect a username and password. I need to know how to talk to Cisco. These other 15 devices, this subset is going to be Juniper. Okay, how do we talk to Juniper via SSH? That might be a little bit different. Okay, so that might be part of your inventory, or that might be a totally different configuration file for how. You know, when I say configuration here, I'm not talking about the actual commands you're pushing down. I'm talking about how do we access the configuration? How do we? What's different about talking to Cisco? than talking to Juniper or Arista. So we're gonna have to configure that somehow with some sort of command line that Ansible or SaltStack came with. And then the third component is, what are the actual things I wanna push down? What do I wanna push down? An access list, an OSPF config, an NTP config. 
Okay. So all of, all of those, so the second two, not necessarily the IP addresses and stuff, but the second components about what makes talking to Cisco different than Juniper and what are the actual things I want to push down, the access list, the OSPF, that requires some sort of scripting knowledge. And the, the script tool or the language depends on the tool you're going to use. So for example, Ansible and Staltstack utilize something called YAML. Puppet and Chef utilize Ruby. And these are called domain specific languages. Languages are specific to this particular configuration tool. Now, before I leave this, what does the Cisco CCNA want you to know as far as this is concerned? They're going to want you to be able to identify that Puppet and Chef use Ruby or that Ansible and SaltStack use YAML. They're not going to expect you to do anything about how do I configure a YAML file? How do I configure Ruby? That, don't worry about that. You don't have to know how to do that. They just want you to be able to pair up these things. This tool uses this scripting language, okay? They don't expect to know anything about the differences between those. Okay, and now we're gonna get into some terminology and concepts before we finish off here with a, a demonstration. So with Puppet, so Puppet was a master and agent. So we got the master residing on the server. We've got the agent, which is software residing in your routers or switches. Then we have Puppet modules, modules which give providers and types. So a Puppet module is that component of the software that knows how to access Cisco is different than Juniper, which is different than HP. So the Puppet module is, you know, you would select a module that's appropriate for Cisco. You would select another module that's appropriate for Juniper, right? If there's no Puppet module for the particular manufacturer of router switch that you have, well, then you might create a new one from scratch. Of course, that'd be really, really difficult, but this is all open source stuff. So if a module doesn't exist, there's nothing stopping you from scripting it yourself. And then the puppet manifest, that is the scripting language that you create that says, make sure that every router has OSPF uh, with this area. Every router has this access list with this name and these lines in it. That's your puppet manifest. The puppet forge is a website where the, all the, you can get all this stuff uh, that other people have created. Lots of other people have created manifests for Cisco and Juniper and stuff like that. So a lot of times you don't have to create these things from scratch. A lot of times you can go to, for example, the Puppet Forge, find a manifest that's close to doing what you want, and then just open up a text editor or something and tweak some of the lines in it to do what you want it to do. So here's an example of what a, pup, uh, a small slice of a Puppet manifest would look like. So you can see, you know, in order to create one of these, you know, reading through it, it's pretty simple. You can see, okay, well, clearly this is talking about OSPF. Uh, the set one's talking about some sort of an OSPF uh, VRF instance. We've got cost and area in there. So I can sort of understand what that is. But creating that, well, now you got to know, okay, where do I put the bracket? Where does it expect me to put a semicolon? Oh, uh, the word ensure is indented. Do I need to indent it three spaces or four spaces? This is where it gets really complicated about knowing what all the rules are to create something like that from scratch. Now, like I said, at the CCNA level or even CCNP level, you don't have to do that, okay? Thank goodness. All right, so another configuration tool that's open source is Chef. So the components of Chef are the Chef workstations. So Chef, the idea of Chef is that Let's say you had uh, 10 different network administrators and all of them were gonna be using Chef to standardize the configurations across your routers and switches. So every single one of those network administrators, they would have a component of Chef installed on their laptop or PC or MacBook and they could sort of check out maybe the, the Cisco OSPF portion make some changes to that. So they're making a change on the workstation. The workstation is their own personal workspace where they can make changes to stuff. And then they upload that to a central location, which is the chef server, okay? So you've got all these workstations, you know, one or more workstations where you can make your changes to your files, upload it to the chef server, and then the chef server talks to the node. The node is your router or your switch. 
So changes are pushed from workstation, which is your laptop or PC to the server, and then pulled from the server to the node. So once again, we have to have some special shift software running in the router switch to be able to reach out to that server and pull information down. And I, I don't know how many Cisco devices in particular support the chef node component, but I can tell you it'd be a very, very small portion of Cisco devices that would do that. And then a chef cookbook. Uh, this is, so cookbooks and recipes found in the chef supermarket. And here's another uh, thing right this. So the chef cookbook is the portion of chef that knows how to speak to Cisco versus speak to Juniper. What makes Cisco and Juniper different, okay? So I would wanna find a cookbook for Cisco devices if I'm gonna to talk to Cisco. And then a recipe is the thing you create for OSPF or for access list or whatever, okay? So that's, that's the recipe. And you might wanna take a screenshot of this and just check out those, those uh, URLs right there if you're interested in more. But this is the extent of what you need to know for the CCNA. And here's an example of some chef recipes. Once again, these also relate to OSPF. So you can sort of compare and contrast these with what we just saw previously with um, Puppet, I think is what we saw. So this is a little bit easier to understand. You know, I don't see all those squiggly brackets there. I don't see a, a bunch of colons versus semicolons. It looks like this spacing and indentation is pretty much consistent. Um, so just looking at these two, I might be inclined to use Chef rather than Puppet because it looks like it's easier to create these things in Chef. Uh, but once again, I'd have to ask myself, do my Cisco devices even support the Chef node capability? If they don't, then this is useless to me. And the last one I wanna talk about and then do a real brief demonstration on is Ansible. So Ansible has the Ansible master and that's it. There's no agent component. So you download the Ansible uh, software onto your laptop, MacBook. It doesn't support Windows, uh, but does support Mac. If you've got a Windows laptop and you wanna play around with this, you'd have to first of all, uh, create like a VM that's running like Linux or something inside the virtual machine. And then you could download Ansible into that VM, but it's not supported natively in a Windows environment. If you're running Mac, you can. Uh, if you're running Ubuntu, you can, so you can download for free, and then that device becomes your Ansible master. Um, like pretty much all these other things, Ansible uses SSH to connect to your managed devices. So like I said earlier, at an absolute minimum, to get this to work on, let's say your routers, let's just stick with routers for right now, what would your routers need? Well, number one, your router would have to have at least one functional IP address. Number two, it would have to have SSH configured, with a username and password so you can SSH into it. And then number three, if your Ansible master is not actually on the same subnet as your router, well then your router's gonna have to have some at least basic routing so it can know how to get back to that master, right? And knows how to get to other remote subnets. If you have those three components, then you can start using Ansible to play around with it. Okay, so with Ansible, We've got Ansible modules, we've got Ansible playbooks. All right, so let's start with the module, first of all. So if I wanna talk to a Cisco device, there are some Ansible modules that go along with that. So an Ansible module, once again, is the sort of, is the thing that says, hey, how does Cisco different than Juniper, which is different than HP? How do I know what's, what, commands I should use, whether it be Cisco iOS commands or Juniper set commands or whatever it is. So with Cisco, there's like an iOS Nexus module so that Ansible can talk to Nexus devices. And then, you know, if you were gonna play around with this in the lab, you would probably just use the Cisco.iOS module for talking to just regular Cisco iOS devices. And then there's sub modules beneath that. So for example, we see here the iOS config module. So if I go to, the, go to um, Ansible and I download the Cisco.iOS main module, within that, there's gonna be a bunch of sub-modules built in. I'm not gonna have to download them, they're all gonna be packaged together. 
But once I'm, once I'm building my in Ansible te terminology, once it's, it's called a task, once I'm building my task, maybe what I want to do is push down a standard banner to all my devices, a message of the day banner. Get out of this router now unless you own this router, okay? Well, within the Cisco.iOS module, there might be a sub-module called Cisco.iOS.banner. And when I'm building my task, I would have to reference that, type it in, and then beneath that, I would say, okay, banner, what's the type? Message of the day. What are the lines I want to type in? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So that's a sub module. iOS underscore config is used for doing like real basic configuration management, like changing a host name, um, maybe configuring an IP address on an interface. So that's a sub module of the Cisco.iOS module that I would use. So why is this relevant? Well, once again, at the CCNA level, you don't have to know what all the names of the modules are and what the sub modules are. You don't have to know that stuff. But if you're actually gonna play around with this stuff in the lab and you wanna to try to build an Ansible script to do something, now you have to start knowing what's the sub module that I need to do what I wanna do. And how do I type it in? Does it need special spacing or not, an indentation? That's where it gets kind of complex. But at the CCA level, just so you know, you don't have to know how to do that, okay? So you, you reference a module and then you define a task. A task is push down this banner, push down this access list. Now, a lot of times when you're doing network automation, you might want to reach out to 20 or 50 devices and do several tasks all at once. You know, you might want to have a series of tasks like, okay, check to see if this banner exists. If it doesn't, push this banner. Check to see if this access list named INE exists. If it doesn't, Push that access list. You might want to do this, 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 and this. So that's what a playbook is. A playbook is once again, a script that you've developed that says, okay, here's task number one. I want to use iOS config to push down this NTP server. I want to use uh, task number two. I want to use iOS banner to push down this banner. So a playbook is something that you create that's got multiple tasks inside of it. And there are lots of existing playbooks that people have already created out there. So most of the time you don't have to create a playbook from scratch. You can just take someone's and just tweak it and modify it. So here's an example of a playbook. So this playbook has, uh, it looks like three different tasks in it. And all three tasks are using the same submodule. They're all using the iOS underscore config submodule. So in task number one, it looks like we're uh, setting a host name. In task number two, we're looking to see if a particular interface, interface Ethernet 1 exists, and if it does, we're putting an IP address on it. So right there, that tells me this particular playbook is probably only good for one device because you wouldn't want to put the same IP address across multiple devices, right? That wouldn't make a lot of sense. And then task number three, uh, we're saying, hey, if these other two interfaces exist, let's put these other IP addresses on them. So you can just see this playbook is just doing multiple tasks. So in summary, um, here's some various tools that we've talked about, knowing what the domain specific language is, whether it's agent based or agent list, and if it's a pull or push model. This stuff you wanna memorize, okay? This is the sort of the level that the CCNA would expect you to know about these tools. Now I go into a bit more detail in, uh, like I said, my introduction network program, programming and automation course in our CCNA learning path. Um, and you'll wanna check that out, but just to give you a high level overview here, this is this. By the way, um, although Puppet is agent-based, I, I do wanna make sure that you're aware that Puppet does have an agentless version they say, hey, you actually can use Puppet on, on any Cisco device because we have an agentless version. What that really means is that you have to have some other device that's got the agent software in it, like a, another server somewhere, and that device in turn can talk to those routers and switches that don't natively support a Puppet agent. I don't know anything else about that. I've never played around with Puppet, so I have no idea what its capabilities are or how difficult it is to use. Of all of these, the only one I've spent any time with is Ansible. And that's what I want to show you right now. Okay, so um, if you want to take a screenshot of this, feel free. 
Uh, this is the, the basic topology I've created for this demonstration. So I have, uh, so the way I've set this up is I have a, a server running VMware ESXi. And in that VMware environment, I've created a virtual machine running Ubuntu. So I've got an Ubuntu desktop in there and that's where my Ansible master is. So in that Ubuntu desktop, I, I downloaded all the Ansible stuff with just a couple of commands. Um, didn't have to have a DHCP server, that's not required, but just because how we've created that Ubuntu uh, VM, it, we need a DHCP server for it. But if I could have put a static IP address on there, I would have, and then I wouldn't need a DHCP server. And then I've got three devices which I'm gonna control. These are also virtual machines. These are also virtual routers, um, R2, R3, and CSR2. And we're gonna control these with Ansible. So let's take a look at how that works. Okay, so just real quickly here, uh, to start out with, I wanna show you that, that all these devices, you know, I've put in here a host name of my name is wrong. So this, my name is wrong, number one. We can see here, my name is wrong, number two. And my name is wrong, number three. Now, if I was gonna do a lab, you know, a lot of times what I do is I will, um, like if I'm gonna do a series of CCNE or CCMP labs, I might start with like a real base configuration. Maybe I'll start with a clean slate where I'll just have a basic host name configured in the device and that's it. And then I wanna be able to return to that over and over and over again. Once I'm done with my OSPF lab, I wanna go back to that clean slate. Once I'm done with my EIGRP lab, I wanna go back to that clean slate. And instead of write, erase and reload over and over and over again, what I'll, I'll do is I'll, I'll save my configuration to flash. Like you can see here, all of these are configurations that I've saved. Uh, clean slate is basically just a host name and nothing else. Now I've got on one here that's called automation demo. Basically all that has on it is a host name, an IP address, and some basic SSH and OSPF config. Just the basic minimum I need to be able to reach my automation server. Now, if I was not doing Ansible and I said, okay, I wanna go to all three of these devices and I wanna have them revert to the automation dash demo. Well, using secure CRT, I can do that, right? Down here in the white area, this white window, I can make sure it's set to send commands to all sessions. And I can just type in here, config replace flash colon automation dash demo. And that would automatically automate all three of these devices to fetch that configuration and replace the current running configuration with that. But instead of doing that, I'm gonna do that with Ansible. I have Ansible actually do that. So before I show you that, let me show you here. So here's my directory in Ubuntu with Ansible and you can see inside of it, let's just clear all this stuff out. So I said that one of the uh, first things you have to do is you have to tell Ansible, what are the devices I want you to talk to? What are the IP addresses or names of devices I want you to talk to? So within my Ansible folder, it comes with, I didn't have to put this in here. When I download Ansible, it, it automatically put this in here. You can see there's a host file. And if I do sudo vim host, I just want to open it up in a text editor and look at it. Okay. So here's my host file. It says, okay, um, when I run my Ansible playbook, if my playbook says, hey, take all this stuff and apply it against the group called Cisco routers, Cisco underscore routers. Well, what is that? Well, Cisco underscore routers is these three devices right here. Now, I could have put the IP addresses of my routers right there, you know, 10.12.12.2 and so on and so forth. And if I had done that, then this would be sufficient. This host file would be sufficient for Ansible to know how, where to reach out to my devices. Here's the problem with that. When I run my playbook, and you'll see this here in just a second, the play, playbook is gonna tell me I reached out to r2.ine.com and this was successful. I reached out to CSR2 and this was a failure. That's meaningful to me. But what if the output said, I reached out to 192.168.5.5 and this failed. I reached out to 10.12.1.1 and this was successful. Well, now I have to remember, oh my gosh, okay, 10.1.1.1, what device was that? 
So if I put a domain name in here like this, now when I run my playbook, the output I get is gonna be more meaningful to me. But I still need an IP address, right? How is it gonna know what the heck r2.ine.com is? Where's the IP address for that? Well, I could have actually had this resolved to a DNS server if I wanted to, but instead, you know, pretty much all notebooks and MacBooks and laptops and stuff have something built into them called a hosts file. Every laptop has one. You may never have seen it, but it's in there. And in a MacBook, which was, or actually in Ubuntu here, if I, so that file, that host file, that's not an Ansible. That is a host file that's just built into the operating system. And if I want to read that, I say sudo vim etsy host. So this, no, it's a different path, right? It's not an Ansible. There's my host file. And you can see in here is where I actually associated those names of R2, CSR2 with the actual IP addresses. So because my Ansible host file had a DNS name, it's now gonna to refer to my sort of sub-level host file to actually resolve what those IP addresses are. So that's already done. So that part is finished. All right. Next, Ansible also comes with what's called an Ansible config file. Didn't have to put it in there. It was already in there. We'll just take a look at it real quickly. Pseudo vim ansible.cfg. And this config file is not where you put like your OSPF or your access list and stuff like that. This is what specifies real generic configurations for Ansible to use. Like, hey, what, what font color should I use when something happens? Or uh, let's just go down a little bit more. Right, um, how long should I wait for a command to time out? Um, you know, what's my connection timeout? So that's what this config file is. How should Ansible operate in general? A lot of times you don't even have to touch this thing. So we're not gonna look any more at that, but that's what that is, but Ansible needs that. Now, where all the work happened is in these YAML files. So YAML, um, you're not gonna be tested on this at the CCA level, but you know, I always like to know what acronyms mean. <laughs> YAML's kind of funny. What does YAML mean? It stands for YAML ain't markup language. Ain't markup language. That's what YAML stands for. The Y is YAML itself, ain't markup language. So this is just um, a scripting language. And so the one I'm gonna start with is my auto-config. I named this. And if we look at this, sudo vim, just put that in there. Okay, this is a real simple playbook. This playbook says, okay, um, I just gave it a descriptive name. That could have been anything. I said, the host you're gonna reach out to is the Cisco underscore routers group. And we just saw it. It's not gonna be able to resolve that. Gather facts. If I said gather facts, yes. That means it would, it would gather back some basic stuff from all my devices, like my host name, the version of software running. I don't care about that. So I said, no. Okay, and this playbook just has one simple task. I've called it load save config. So here is the Ansible module, cisco.ios, right? If I was using this for Juniper or something, I'd have to change that. And the submodule is the iOS underscore command submodule. And here I'm gonna give it one command. Configure replace from flash automation dash demo and force means don't prompt me for yes or no, just do it. All right, so real simple thing here. So now that I've got that, to load that configuration, or actually to play that playbook, I just simply type ansible-playbook, and then I put that in there. Okay, so it says, here's the play I'm doing, and that's the name of the playbook I created. And here's the first task, load, save, config. Okay, so that means it actually was able to successfully reach out to these three devices. Okay, load, save, config, play, recap. Now, this is sort of interesting here because we'll check this out. 
Because if it actually changed something, I would expected the change to be one. Change equals one would mean I changed something. It says change zero. Let's see here. Oh, all right, well, it did change something. Because notice, the name is now different. Okay, so it did change it. I'm not sure why, oops, I'm not sure why we didn't see that. Because normally what I would see here is uh, changed equals one. But like I said, I've just been scratching the surface of Ansible for the last couple of weeks. So I might be misinterpreting what that means, but we can clearly see it worked. Okay, so now maybe the next thing I wanna do is I want to load a standard banner. Actually, let's say that what I wanna do now is, let's say maybe all these devices have a standard banner. I say, okay, um, I wanna create a new banner that I wanna push down to all these guys, which is, I'll create a YAML file called this. Okay, so once again, I'm reaching out to the same group of devices and this thing has two tasks. Task number one is called delete existing banner. So if there's, a, if there's an existing banner, a message of the day banner, make sure its state is absent. In other words, kill it, get rid of any existing message of the day banner. The next task in this playbook is to create a new banner. I'm using the same module and submodule, and here's the banner I wanna put on all my devices, and I wanna make sure that this is present on all the devices. So I'm just gonna play that playbook. Ansible-playbook, we're gonna put this in here. change existing banner. So right now what it's doing in the background is, is SSHing into each one of those devices in my Cisco underscore routers group and it's going through the tasks. So, okay, so it deleted the existing banner. Okay, now it changed, there we go, change new banner. All right, so this time we actually did get changed equals one. Not sure we, why we didn't get that the last time, but now I can see if I exit out of here, there's my new banner. And if I looked at all three devices, they would all three have that. Now let's say Saturday is done, right? Uh, this banner is no longer applicable and I wanna put all my devices back to their normal default banner. Well, instead of logging into each one, one by one, I can run this other playbook, which is called the daily banner. Run that. And that's the same thing's gonna happen. It's SSHing into all the devices, and then it's going to delete that existing message of the day banner and put back in there what my normal daily banner would be. I'm not gonna show you that YAML file for time's sake, but there's another playbook for that. Okay, and now if I exit, get back in, and now here is my regular daily banner. So that is an example of Ansible as an automation tool. And that, my friends, brings me to the end of our time, or at least my time with you. Uh, so let me go ahead and see now if we have any questions. Uh, let's see here, let me check the Q&A. All right, we've got a couple. So from FISA, is, is the Cisco Prime infrastructure considered to be an automation tool? I would say yes, I would say yes to that. I don't know the details of how that works, but from what little I know of Cisco Prime infrastructure, yes, it is supposed to automate things. All right, anonymous, uh, let's see here, Keith, what do you recommend if you want to read more about network automation and also some suggestions on ideal desktop setup for practicing network automation. Wow, okay. Well, I have not found any one single source for network automation. Um, you really just have to hunt and peck for what you want. 
So I'll tell you what I did to get to the point where I could create those Ansible files and I could do that kind of stuff. Uh, so number one, you know, I'm always a big proponent of the Cisco official certification guides. I would definitely read the chapters they have in there on network automation on the CCNA official certification guide. I'd start with that. Number two, um, if you want to play around with this stuff, you're probably going to, want to play around with Ansible uh, because most Cisco devices, you're not going to be able to support Puppet and Chef and Salt Stack. So Ansible would probably be the one you want to go to. So for that, um, we at INE, we have some videos. I have not actually looked at them myself, but I just saw these this morning. Oops, where is it? So if you look here, can I move this over? Yes. If you go in and you go under discover and you click on development, okay, development right there, you'll see that there is, we have, for example, Ansible basics, uh, network automation with Ansible, another one network automation with Ansible. So I, I would look at those. And then above and beyond that, I would start Google searching things like Cisco Automation Ansible. I would use those as like my keywords or Cisco IOS Ansible. And then start thinking about what are some real basic things I could do? You know, don't start out with a real lofty goal for yourself of, oh, I wanna configure a fully function access list and OSPF and you're gonna kill yourself trying to accomplish that. Think of something basic like, let's see if I can get Ansible to just, number one, reach out to two or three devices and give me back uh, the show IP interface brief output. Let's just see if I can do that. If I can do that, then maybe the next thing is, let me just see if I can uh, configure a common NTP server, one line NTP server on all the devices. Because what I found in the last couple of weeks was that creating these YAML files, these playbooks is real challenging only because I haven't found any good documentation on it. There's a lot of sample YAML files out there, but what they don't tell you is specifically where the indentation needs to be, that this needs to be either directly underneath this line or indented underneath this line. And YAML is super, super picky about where you indent and how much you indent. I can't tell you how many times I was banging my head against a wall because I had basically copied and pasted a YAML file that was exactly the same as what I saw on a website and it wasn't working. Um, so you just have to try that. Just try to find some sample YAML files and open up a text editor and try to create those and, and tweak those to start out real small and then get bigger. Um, clearly you'll need something that supports Ansible like uh, Ubuntu as a VM, or you can, you can run it natively in Mac OS if you have a MacBook. Uh, like I said, if you have a Windows device, you'll have to create a VM, just create a VM that has Ubuntu in it, right? That's free, you don't have to pay anything for Ubuntu. And then you can download Ansible into that. And then you'll need at least one device, like one router or switch that your laptop or PC can reach so you can try to program it. It could be something sitting on your desktop if you have one. Um, I've seen, I don't know how to do this, but I've seen people create GNS3 environments with routers and switches, Cisco IOS devices in their GNS3, and then they have an Ansible VM able to reach out and touch those devices and program. So I know that's possible. I just don't know how to do it. Um, so that's based, the basic environment you'd want to set up to start practicing that. All right. So, Wilson asks, would you agree or disagree that network automation and programmability is slowly turning your network admin or engineer into dev? Not anything deep like full-blown software dev, but someone who can write code and implement infrastructure's code on the network side. Good question, Wilson. Um, so once again, this really depends on the network you're working in, right? Like I, like I said, if, if you are if your job is to work in a library's network, um, or maybe even a small elementary school's network or something, chances are you'll never touch this stuff. 
right? You're gonna be creating a network that basically you configure once and then maybe just monitor it every day. Make sure the CPU is okay. Now you could use Ansible for that. You could use Ansible to automatically log into all devices every single day and give you back the, the show blah, blah, blah output. Um, but for those networks, those really big networks that do change fairly frequently, where a tool like Ansible would be helpful, then um, well, even to work with Ansible, right? Ansible or Puppet or Chef, none of these things are gonna do you any good if you don't know how OSPF works. How can you program OSPF if you don't know what an area is? If you don't know that OSPF uses network statements, right? It's, it's not gonna help you if you don't know what an access list is or what the difference is between SSH and Telnet. So all that basic network knowledge you still have to know so you know what to program into your YAML file and what not to program. Um, but yeah, it is starting to get more on the development side. Um, but man, maybe a little bit. I, I, I don't see this as forcing people to become like true blown developers yet. Uh, okay. So Dragomir. Can you recommend a website or Git repository for NX OS playbooks? Um, that's, I would just say Ansible, Cisco, Nexus, playbook. I would just search for that. And then in here, you should find some stuff and you could even go further than that, OSPF, right? And then here's some, maybe some stuff you could find on playbooks for, for OSPF. I would just Google with those terms. I'm sure you can find playbooks out there for that. There, um, the, the main repository that Ansible uses is called the Ansible Galaxy. Okay, so you've got the Puppet Forge where people store their stuff and you've got the Ansible Galaxy. So you could also use that in your Google search, Ansible Galaxy. All right, Mohammed. Does Ansible need to be nearest to your devices for optimal reachability? No, no. I mean, if you look at my topology right here, my Ansible master was physically connected to the same VLAN as R2, but CSR2 and R3 are not connected. Um, as long as you can SSH to the device, as long as you've got IP connectivity to the device, it could be all the way across the world, uh, but Ansible should still be able to reach it. So, this isn't really something where latency is much of a concern, right? You're just trying to push down a configuration file. So if there's a, a half second of latency to get to that device in India or Russia or China, wherever it is, Ansible doesn't care. It can still reach it. Okay. And Anonymous says, can you give the PDF of this webinar? I don't have that on me, but... Like I mentioned, if you go to, if you're already an INE customer and you can access the CCNA learning path, right, so here's all of our learning paths. And if you go down to CCNA, which is in here somewhere, here it is, CCNA right there. And then it's towards the bottom. Da, 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 da. Where is it? Right here. Network automation and programmability. So if you click on this, which is a lot more detail, I think in here somewhere, yes. See right here where it says course files? If you click on that, you'll get PDFs of, of all of my slides. And like I said, 95% of the slides I presented today were from this course right here. Okay, uh, Mahmoud says, uh, I'm a big fan of you. You're my favorite instructor. Oh, thank you, Mahmoud. That's very nice of you. Uh, do you think that automation tools will completely replace all traditional command line? No, I, 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 don't, I don't see that happening uh, for a variety of reasons. Number one, like I said, not every network needs automation. Okay, this is really, really just beneficial for the really large enterprise and government and ISP networks. 
when you're talking about most of the small networks and the medium sized networks of which there are millions and millions of them around the world, most of those networks will never need anything like this. So you'll still need command line language if those networks are working with Cisco to be able to program those devices. Um, and even the really large networks, um, at least today, you still need to know the command line to initially configure your devices. You still need to be able to get in there and use the command line to configure your initial OSPF, to configure your initial access list, your SSH telnet, uh, your SSH access and stuff like that. So I don't see any time soon where an engineer will no longer need the command line at all. I, I don't think we have to worry about that. Maybe our, our grandkids have to worry about that, but not us. What else? Just mark off some of these here. Um, Alfred uh, you is asking me a question about the CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure Lab and what level of expertise is required for that. Honestly, I don't know. Um, I haven't taken that lab. I haven't really looked into the details of that. So I can't answer that. I'm just, so I'm sorry, but I can't help you with that too much. I know the blueprint says you need a little bit of Python knowledge. So you need to at least be able to recognize some basic Python stuff, like, you know, what is a variable? How does a, a, a for loop work? Stuff like that I'm sure would be required. All right, let's see here. Uh, Mahmoud is basically just to paraphrase Mahmoud or Muhammad. Muhammad, what you're asking to paraphrase is how do I know what the correct module and sub module are for what I want to do? So the first thing you have to ask yourself is what is the manufacturer of the equipment I want to touch? Now we're dealing with Cisco CCNA right now. So let's just say it's Cisco. Okay. So if you start with Cisco and uh, Ansible Cisco, let's just say modules. Okay, so right here, explore network modules for Cisco. So if you click on that, this is a good starting point. Uh, and so right here, this shows you the high level modules that are available for Cisco, Cisco UCS, Cisco NSO. Um, so if you're dealing with Cisco IOS, it would be this one. I would click on that. And it's broken. But from here, you can probably just type Cisco IOS. And now we start getting right here, we get start getting some of the submodules, IOS underscore user, iOS.iOS. So you can just scroll through here and start trying to find a module that looks appropriate for what you want to do. And then if you click on one, like that one, I'm just randomly picking iOS underscore interface. So once you download Ansible, uh, the second step is you're gonna wanna download the Cisco.iOS module. And just shows you right here how to do that. And then if you wanna use the submodule, you know, somewhere in your playbook, you would have to type in, this is the submodule I wanna use, that'd be part of your playbook. And it looks like this was deprecated, so this really isn't used anymore. But these are the various variables or parameters that this submodule can use. And this is where it starts getting really complicated about how to actually put this into a playbook. And is it indented two spaces? Is it indented four spaces? This is where it just becomes really useful to try to find somebody else's playbook that is using this submodule and see how they created it so you can tweak it. Um, Axel says, can Ansible work with legacy devices such as 2960s, 2600 routers? As long as your router switch supports SSH, Ansible can work with it. So even like the 2500 series routers from like 20 years ago, you could have Ansible work with that because every Cisco device I can pretty much think of for the last 20 years has supported the ability to configure SSH so you could access it via SSH. And that's the only required minimum that, that Ansible needs. Ansible does not support Telnet, by the way. I banged my head for a good half a day trying to figure out how to get Ansible to support Telnet because I want to capture it in a sniffer trace so I could see what was going back and forth. And the problem with SSH 
is that everything in SSH is encrypted. So if you capture it in a sniffer trace, you can't see anything because the body is all encrypted. So I thought, oh, wouldn't it be kind of cool if I could get Ansible to use Telnet instead so I could actually see what it's doing, but it doesn't support Telnet. There is a Telnet module, but it short thing is it doesn't work. <laughs> Let me just leave it at that. It doesn't work for accessing Cisco devices. So SSH is your only option. Um, um, Mujtaba, you're asking, is there specific new training for the new CCNA and INE? Yeah, absolutely. So if I just go back here, under the CCNA learning path that I just showed you, for CCNA, some of this stuff is existing courses that we had that are still absolutely relevant to the new CCNA. And I, I figured why reinvent the wheel and record the same thing all over again. And then some of this stuff is brand new. Uh, for example, the wireless things in here were new, right? That was for the new CCNA, so I put all that in there. That's new stuff. Um, there's other courses in here as well. Introduction to EIGRP, I just recorded that like three weeks ago, so that's in there. And by the way, EIGRP is going to be in your CCNA. I saw questions on it, even though it's not in the blueprint, it's there. At least I got it. You might not get it, but I got questions on it. All right, uh, what else? Yes, yeah, so uh, Boss Vanderveen, you can use YAML lint to parse YAML files. It will point out what is wrong if there are errors in the file. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did read online about YAML lint, but uh, in my Ubuntu VM, I was sort of pressed for time and I couldn't figure out a quick way to download and use that. I don't even know if it's a downloadable thing or if it's a website, but I did read that there was that tool called YAML lint that will help you create YAML files. Um, it probably would have saved me a lot of time up front if I had found that out. But yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. And what else do we have? We're sort of running out of time here. We've gone way over. Let me just go ahead and answer like another four questions. Let's see here. Okay, so someone's ask, asking to please re-explain how APIs on a network device can be used to automate it. Okay, so if a device, let's say for example, we got a, a, a Cisco iOS router and this iOS router was in the, in the marketing papers on it, it says this iOS router supports the Cisco API. That's the name of our API, the Cisco API. Now, Cisco actually does have APIs. It's not called the Cisco API. They've got other names for it, but let's just say that, okay? It said this router that you bought here supports the Cisco API. Okay, so at a real high level, what that means is that, number one, that API is gonna be um, IP based. Okay, that means it's listening for IP packets, just like Telnet and SSH are listening for IP packets. Telnet is listening for IP packets with TCP port 23, SSH is TCP port 22. Um, an IP-based uh, API is typically listening for either HTTP or HTTPS packets, right? Port 80 or port 443, so that's the first thing. Uh, if you wanna access that API, you have to send that router IP packets with HTTP or HTTPS headers behind it. Then secondly, you'd have to open up the API documentation and say, and read through, you know, if, if I have an objective in mind, like, okay, I wanna change the host name. Okay, well, how's the API expecting me to send that information? It might not be the host name command. Um, it might be host, and then colon, quotation marks, name, right? But I wouldn't know that unless I read the API documentation. So I need to find the documentation, documentation see how is it expecting the format of the data to come across. Now, most of the time, in reality, we don't care about that. Why is that? Well, because if a router is running the Cisco API, if I wanna automate something, I'm most likely gonna use some sort of application like DNA Center, and DNA Center will come built in understanding 
the Cisco API, right? The DNA Center appliance will say, hey, we work with the Cisco API, the Juniper API, you know, whatever. So if I go into the DNA Center and I find that router in my topology diagram and I click on it, there might be a, 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 a field in there where I can, you know, it says, what would you like to change? Oh, select host name. What would you like to change the host name to? Router one. The moment I click that and I click apply, that DNA center will know because it has a Cisco API in it. It'll know, okay, I need to create an IP packet, fill it with HTTPS, with the correct HTTPS headers. And in the body, I need to send host name, colon, bracket, exclamation point, blah, blah, blah. It'll know all that. So the only time you as a human being need to actually know what, how does API work? How does it expect the data to actually look and be structured? The only time you'd need to know that is either A, if you plan on creating your own software application. So you know what? I wanna create my own software app that I wanna to sell to people that interfaces with this API. Well now as you program that app in C++ or JavaScript or whatever, you're gonna to have to have that app know all those gory details or B, Sometimes in some of these labs that Cisco gives you, they might say, hey, open up this tool called Postman. Postman is a free browser-based tool. And in Postman, you can craft AT, um, HTTP messages. You can say, okay, in Postman, here's where I want you to go. Here's the IP address. Here's what I want the HTTP headers to look like. Here's what I want the authentication to look like. And here's what I want the body to look like host name, colon, bracket, blah, blah, blah. And then you can send that one command and say, oh, wow, look at that. The API actually works. I got a response back. But in the real world of automation, you wouldn't be doing that, right? You're not gonna be creating your own program. You're gonna be using somebody else's program that interfaces with that API. So you don't really have to know the gory details of how the API works. All right. Um, Let's see here, a couple more questions and then we'll bring it to a close. Erickson asks, what level of Cisco certification requires the real implementation of automation? Okay, well, at the CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure Lab level, um, I have read through the blueprint of that. And well, actually, let's just take a quick look at that. Cisco CCI Enterprise Infrastructure. Practical exam. Exam topics. Okay, so if we go, if you guys make it to this point, infrastructure automation and programmability. Okay. Um, so right here, they're gonna expect you to know a little bit about Python, right? So. Uh, I don't think they're gonna expect you to be a Python guru, but, they'll have, but you'll have to know enough about Python to do some basic things, like maybe change a host name, maybe automatically uh, bounce an interface if something happens. Um, this stuff is all about SD-WAN. I don't know a whole lot about that. Interaction with Cisco DNA Center API. Okay, so via Python request library and Postman. Okay, so they're gonna expect you to know how the Postman tool works to craft it to create specific HTTP messages and get a response back from the DNA Center API. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. So several Python's things here. So I'm not sure what level of Python you need, but clearly you're gonna to wanna to spend a few months studying Python if you don't already know it in order to get to this exam. And, uh, I don't know much about this. So no mention in here of Ansible or of, um, Puppet or anything like that. But if we go to the DevNet exams, I would expect that to show up in there. Cisco CCNA DevNet. Let's just see what the CCNA DevNet has you do. So this is the CCNA level here. Associate, DevNet Associate, DevNet Associate. 
All right, knowledge domain, understand infrastructure and automation is 20%. View exam topics. All right, so where, are we, where do we actually have to do something here? Describe, describe, compare, explain, identify, utilize common version control with Git. Okay, so we don't really have to do anything here. Understanding using APIs, application. How about infrastructure and automation? Let's open that one up. Describe, compare, describe, 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 identify, 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 interpret. Okay, so it looks like at the CCNA DevNet, they still don't expect you to actually do this stuff. So maybe at the CCNP DevNet, they would expect that, but that's where I would go. Okay, and Okay, and uh, last question here. So uh, Junaid, you asked a question. You said, I don't see the need for Python in the demonstration. If I go with Ansible solution, should I learn Python? I didn't have to know anything about Python to get to that point. Um, so Ansible as a tool was actually written in Python. Um, so I suppose if you want to really tweak, and it is open source, right? So I'm sure you could find the Python code if you wanted to and tweak some of it. I don't really see where you'd need that. Um, and then Ansible uses a different, for some of the really complex scripting stuff, like, and I just ran across this briefly, like if you want to log into via SSA, have Ansible log into a router and look for the presence of an access list that has this match against a TCP port number from 20 to 25, right? Something where you use regular expressions. Look for this pattern. Does this pattern exist? Replace it with this pattern. Well, in that case, Ansible has a, a scripting language that you use. Uh, it started with a J. It wasn't JSON. It was, there was some other scripting language. It wasn't Python though. Um, but short answer, from what I've been able to tell over the last couple of weeks, you don't really need to know Python in order to get Ansible to do most of what a network engineer would need. So that would be the short answer to that. All right, everybody. Uh, it's now 1247, according to my clock here. And we have gone way over time, but I really hope that this was a useful presentation for you, that you guys learned a lot. And hopefully it took away some of the fear and trepidation some of you might have had regarding network automation.